Oh, good afternoon. It is the 14th of August, and uh, here's our quarterly update on the portfolios that you can, or the bundles that you can buy to into via Easy Equities. Uh, SA Champions portfolio is reflecting the disappointment that's going on in South Africa, really struggling. Uh, it's just kind of holding its own at the moment. Thank goodness we've got NASPERS and Discovery in there to pull everything up. But the exponential portfolio is flying. Uh, launched in November last year, we are now above 30% return in that portfolio in US dollar terms. So it's, uh, let's start off with the exponential portfolio. And you can see there, the only one that's really troubling us at the moment is Alibaba. It uh, spikes out at you there, an 8% decline. Adobe Systems, remember, we only just bought into that last month. Um, but uh, the fantastic, uh, phenomenal performance by Amazon, Alphabet, Apple, and Microsoft. As you can see, it compares with the Vanguard S&P 500 index, which is the index uh, tracking the S&P 500 overall, and that's up by 11%. So they're all easily outperforming the market. Uh, Alibaba is um, below, and Adobe Systems we've just brought in, so we can't really compare that one. But before uh, we go into the details, my colleague Stuart Lohman is in Johannesburg. Stuart? Thanks, Alec. Always good to be here. Um, just quickly before we get cracking, um, can you just raise your hands if you can hear me and see Alex's exponential portfolio slide on your screens? Uh, okay, I see a few hands coming through, but slowly, but they're coming. So that's obviously working there, Alec. Um, and obviously, we do like to keep it very conversational. So the little questions are dropped down menu on the right hand control panel. If you just pop your questions in there, I'll interrupt Alec as you run through the portfolio. But thanks as always, Alec. I think we can get cracking. Indeed, we can. Thank you, Stu. Uh, as you can see there, the uh, from this uh, slide, in fact, I, I missed one, and that just tells you what the mandate is. US listed companies with exponential growth potential. I almost feel like saying to you, uh, now is the time to just be putting all your money into the offshore portfolio um, when it has achieved a 32% return since November last year. We really can't ask for anything more than that. But uh, it's been correctly focused uh, as far as the market is concerned. Uh, love Apple, uh, uh, also love Amazon. And you can see Amazon is now up to 35% of the portfolio. Uh, we actually started off there with a much smaller shareholding, but because it has moved up that aggressively, it was 25% to start with, because of the share price rise in Amazon, it's now uh, accounting for over a third of the portfolio. And you can see the others uh, have really done well as well. Alibaba Group, I'll talk about that in just a little while. Moving on to the uh, reason why we are invested offshore, and I'd like you to take your time and just absorb this graph. This is the RAND versus the US dollar graph going back for a year. And if you look at it carefully, in the run-up from the 13th of November, in the run-up to the ANC elective conference, there was suddenly some kind of inkling amongst investors that there could be a change from the Zuma uh, dynasty or proposed Zuma dynasty. And that's pretty relevant as we'll discuss in, uh, in the next slide. But you can see they're going back to the 13th of November, which was a peak where the RAND got to nearly 14 and a half against the US dollar. Uh, the RAND improved, improved, improved. And then post uh, the 18th of December election of Ramaphosa continued to improve and got to 1180 in mid-February or mid to late February. So 1180 against the US dollar. And then we found that the perfection or being priced for perfection uh, and the Ramaphoria effect was then starting to dissipate. And you can see what happened in the last week with that surge, uh, the wrong way this is, in the RAND's value against the US dollar. It's gone the wrong way. It's gone from 13 and a half, got as high as 15 and a half, and that would take us right off the chart. This is a chart that's just um, reduced things back to, or, or taken that spike out. And as you can see, the RAND is now trading a little closer to 14, but it's still very, very uh, uh, in line with where we were a year ago. So this portfolio in US dollars, uh, in when you translate it into rands, uh, it it has performed pretty much uh, as in the same way as it does in US dollars at the moment, which is over 30%, an incredible performance. Um, but mm -hmm. what I want to show you is this graph. 
And this is what would have happened to the South African RAND had Cyril Ramaphosa not been elected in December. It's a really, really interesting graph. The blue line is the Turkish Lira. The black line is the South African RAND. And if you have a look at that, the RAND is pretty much where it was a year ago. The Lira on the other end is down by 45% on the past year, and it has fallen sharply in the, in the uh, last few days. That is as a crisis has hit the Lira, that has also affected the South African Rand as well, um, which has been, come under pressure against the US dollar as a consequence of the emerging markets crisis. But if you go back to the kind of economic policies that Jacob Zuma and his successor or his preferred successor Nkosa Zana uh, were going to be following, we would by this stage have been following the Turkish Lira. And what does that mean? Well, the South African Rand, had Zuma been elected, Mrs. Zuma been elected in December rather than Ramaphosa, would today be sitting at around 21 Rand to the US dollar if it had followed the Turkish trajectory. 21 Rand instead of just over 14. That's quite a scary thought, isn't it? It uh, is also uh, the implication to that was we would have seen interest rates significantly higher than where they are at the moment. And for anybody who uses anything that's imported, and that's pretty much everybody in South Africa, given that it is an open economy with more than 50% of GDP, either imports and exports, uh, imports would have been 50% at least more expensive. So could have been a lot worse than the way it is right now. On to the US market generally over the past month uh, or couple of months, maybe this is a quarterly uh, update that we give you for these two portfolios. Uh, the US market has been steady, in fact, improving a little bit. Uh, the, this is the reflection of the VOO, that is the Vanguard S&P 500 index, which tracks the way that the uh, US market goes or the S&P 500 goes. And as you can see in the past month or so, it's gone from around $250 uh, to $260, which is a, a slight improvement there. Uh, we, of course, have been benefiting or riding on the back of Amazon. So a pretty good place to start. A nice picture of Jeff Bezos there. Uh, and uh, there is the Amazon effect and it continues to roll. It continues to gather momentum. Amazon brought financial results out uh, in the past month uh, towards the end of July. And it's, it's worth just reflecting on them a little bit. Here is a company that is now worth almost uh, 900 billion, sorry, it's over 900 billion dollars, 920 billion US dollars, second biggest market cap in the world. It is growing at its revenues at 39% a year. So the revenues for the second quarter of 2018, in other words, the three months to the end of June, were at 53 billion US dollars, were up 39%. But what is really interesting and what's caught the uh, imagination of investors as you can see, the improvement in the price in the last few weeks has been the fact that they're now starting to uh, crank out profits as well. The highest ever quarterly profit was declared for the second quarter to end June, and that was $2.5 billion. Uh, the, that came in at $5 a share. A year ago, the profit was $0.40 cents a share. That gives you an indication of the way that Amazon is now able to translate its, its massive revenue growth into bottom line numbers. Uh, Amazon Web Services is one, a, a big reason for this. It's the cloud operation that Amazon uh, introduced long before anybody else. If you have uh, any of your data, as most companies around the world and many individuals do, uh, residing in the cloud, chances are it'll be with Amazon, uh, which has a 51.8%, call it 52% share of the cloud market. And uh, pretty much everybody nowadays is at least having backups. Many of us are put, entrusting everything to the cloud outside of the old system of having it on hard drives. And Amazon Web Services got 52% of that market. The second uh, biggest player in that area is Microsoft, which is sitting at 13%. Microsoft does break out the profits that it makes from the cloud, and its profit margin is 40 47% in the most recent uh, quarterly. So it gives you an indication of how incredibly profitable 
the decision by Amazon was to go into cloud uh, hosting years ago. The rest of the business, of course, is really pumping as well. Uh, the acquisition for 13 and a half billion of Whole Foods is now occupying quite a lot of Jeff Bezos's attention. And Whole Foods has uh, been given them the opportunity to bump up the fee on Amazon Prime by 20% in its core US market to $119 a share. More than 100 million members of Amazon Prime. We are members here in our household and uh, we get fantastic value for it. In America now, with the deal that they did with the food retailer Whole Foods, Americans can now click and collect. So you have a Whole Foods nearby, you go online on Amazon, uh, buy what you want, and if you want to pick it up in 30 minutes, you pay an extra $5. If you want to pick it up in an hour, you pay nothing. And that uh, just gives you an indication of the way that this company is really starting to revolutionize other areas, areas that uh, it, it isn't already um, involved in the Amazon effect, as Warren Buffett described it, is irresistible. The momentum rolls on, and to have 35% of our portfolio in this company to me is not a risk. Stu? Uh, look, it's a bit quiet this side, no questions yet, uh, but I'll prompt you as soon as you've got something. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, let's, let's do that. And just to remind you that uh, you can ask. Uh, or rather go into the questions. Stuart is there waiting for you and he will stop me as we go through. You can see quite clearly Amazon is the portfolio star, um, but also very good performance by Microsoft, Apple and Alphabet. Uh, we'll move on to the second of those now, and that is um, Apple, which got to a trillion dollars. It's the first company in the race to a trillion. And um, it, it hit that number on the 2nd of August, which I guess will go down in uh, economic history as a consequence of that. It, it's interesting to just track very briefly the Apple story. It started in 1980 when, uh, sorry, it's, it started as far as the public companies are concerned in 1980 when it listed on the uh, New York stock market for $22 a share. As you can see, it's a 10-bagger. Uh, or almost a 10 bagger since then, but it's had a very up and down ride. Uh, in 1985, Steve Jobs was fired, the founder of Apple. He was then pulled back in in 1997 when the company was on its knees and uh, sent through a series of innovations, which has put it uh, into the position it's in now. In 2001, introduced the iPod. 2003, he introduced iTunes. 2007, though, was the big one, and that was the introduction of the iPhone. 2010, the iPad. Uh, Steve Jobs then passed away in 2011. And in 2014, there was another uh, surge in the Apple sales and profits when they uh, brought out oversized iPhones for the first time. That was in the iPhone 6. And uh, 2017 was the launch of the iPhone X which has uh, come onto the market at $1,000 a phone, but because it is so advanced and so popular, it's substantially raised the uh, average selling price of, uh, of Apple's iPhone. So they've managed to continue to, to rise, to, uh, to deliver a better return on uh, the two, two shareholders in terms of both uh, revenue growth and in terms of profitability. And we wait now for next month, to hear what the latest uh, new product is. They always, uh, Apple always launches its new products in September. It'll be interesting to see what uh, rabbits, um, Tim Cook and his team are gonna be pulling out the hat at that point in time. Um, Warren Buffett bought into the shares around about the $140 a share level. So he's done a, and he only bought it fairly recently. So he's had a very good return on his investment. Microsoft uh, is one of the other, companies. In fact, it used to be the biggest company in the world. Uh, interestingly, Apple is now about 4% of the S&P 500 index being the uh, most valuable company on earth. But Microsoft in its day in 1999, when it was the most valuable company, was almost 5% of the S&P 500 index. It's uh, made a, a good recovery. The financial results for the quarter to end June, saw it going through $100 billion for the first time. And interestingly here, they are starting to make some kind of progress towards Amazon in the cloud space. Um, the profit margin, I said 47%, it was actually 41%. Uh, 
um, but up from 37% a year ago. That's the profit margin in cloud. So it shows you cloud computing is a very exciting area to be in. And Microsoft's got just over 13% of the global market. So that helps. Something that is uh, causing a little bit of concern is that Satya Nadella, the uh, chief executive of Microsoft, sold a third of his shares in the past couple of weeks. Uh, he cashed in $36 million, the biggest sale he made since, in fact, the first sale he made since 2016, when he sold $8 million of shares. That's 30% of his total shareholding. Of course, the story that comes out always when chief executives sell their shares is that it's part of a structured plan and he's going to be selling more shares to diversify his portfolio, blah, blah, blah. Um, the reality of this is that a chief executive of a company who sells, sells stock in his own company is really sending you a message. And the message here is that we need to be perhaps a little cautious about Microsoft. I invested in the company for us, uh, well, right at the outset, and it was based on the uh, excitement with Microsoft swing towards a subscription model. And that indeed has paid off and it's paid off very well. As you've uh, seen, we've made a very good return in this portfolio on the Microsoft investment. Um, I'm starting to wonder now if there might be better opportunities. You might remember that uh, the last time we spoke, uh, we were also looking at Twitter and Netflix. Um, I was a little concerned about the two of them, which had run too hard. And then we bought into Adobe. Well, Adobe, as it happens, the share price has been uh, very turbulent. It fell down from the 256 level that we bought it at to below 240 but it has recovered from the 240 level and it's now trading at 253. So pretty much unchanged from where we bought in June. However, Twitter is down 26% and Netflix, which today announced that its uh, long-term chief financial officer is leaving, is down 17%. What is that telling me? Well, it, uh, it tells me that there's an exciting opportunity in both Twitter and Netflix. I'll be doing my work on those two. Maybe it's time for us to listen to what Sachin Nadella has been saying about his stock in Microsoft. It might also be time for us to consider what Donald Trump is doing, because he's completely trashed Alibaba. When you have a look at this share price uh, of Alibaba, it was going in the right direction up until June, and then it has just reversed and reversed significantly. We're showing an 8% decline at the moment, uh, but who knows with the way that uh, the Trump versus China war is going on, where it will all end. Alibaba is also a player in cloud computing. It's a phenomenal business in China, but it does appear as though American investors are falling out of love uh, with Alibaba, and we need to bear this in mind. Um, the trashing that uh, Trump has given to Turkey as well, particularly in the uh, light of the arrest in Turkey of a pastor uh, from North Carolina, uh, accused of uh, being an enemy of the state or whatever else Erdogan wants to uh, wants to call it. Um, these are issues that are now weighing very heavily on the Turkish lira at the moment. But I think Turkey, uh, on reflection, was an accident waiting to happen. Some people might say that South Africa was also an accident waiting to happen with the whole expropriation without compensation land issue. And uh, that certainly has been reverberating around the world and causing quite a lot of concerns. One hopes that the, uh, there, are, there are other issues that will be able to offset it. Certainly the, the, the feedback we're getting on the EWC or expropriation without compensation story is that it's well recognized what an impact this will have on South Africa if it were to go the Zimbabwean route. Uh, and although there is um, concerns uh, within the ruling party on both ways, it, it looks like this is something that um, that, that is, in the, until we see something concrete, is not really going to smash the rand again. But it, it makes it takes away the rand shock, absor shock absorbers, and we've seen from Turkey how quickly uh, emerging markets can change uh, and can change in sympathy with others. Moving on to the champions portfolio, the champions mandate. This is a uh, an investment into South Africa's. Um, best entrepreneurs listed on JSC, in JSE listed companies. So it is a, um, a portfolio that is going to be hugely affected by the performance of the South African market. And as you are may, may be well aware, and you would have read on Business Premium in the last a few weeks, uh, the South African market has been in a slump. Uh, volumes are very low. There's not a lot of interest outside of the big names. 
and we'll see that a little later being reflected in the portfolio. But I took this graph from the Financial Times, which shows you the broad trends um, of the JSE All Share Index. And as you can see, it's been very volatile uh, since, well, pretty much uh, since November last year. A good run up and then a, then a big smack, and then a big run up and then a big smack, and so on and so forth. And the volatility uh, there would take you from about 59,000 on the index down to about 55,000. So it's 10% pretty easily that you can see a difference in the JSC All Share Index. Against that, uh, if you look at it from a longer term, it really is just pedestrian. It's it's a, it's down from where it began the year, of course, but uh, it is a market that is that really is going nowhere at the moment, um, with political issues weighing pretty heavily on it. The SA Champions portfolio is reflecting this. We've invested heavily, as you can see, with almost half of the portfolio uh, in Naspers and Discovery. Uh, Discovery rebounded really nicely in this uh, in the past couple of months, and Naspers has been holding its head up as well. But outside of those two, it's been a little bit of a, a disaster area. Uh, long for life, uh, when, when even Brian Joffe's company is down by 13% less it's it's trading at less than the price at which Joffe's funders put in 500 million uh, rands. So you got to know that there's something pretty, pretty amiss with the confidence in South Africa. If that's happening, you've got your potentially one of your greatest entrepreneurs, certainly uh, the greatest industrial sector entrepreneur running a business that he's uh, he's, he's having. A, he's got his own 100 million rand of his own money in and the share price is below the level at which uh, it, it started off. You gotta know there's something strange happening. Um, and First Rand is holding its head a big loss by Investec in the past month. Uh, that was related uh, to some news there that the, uh, well, two bits of news that shareholders did not like, the reappointment of KPMG as auditors at Investec after all the strange things that KPMG has been up to in South Africa. 20% uh, of shareholders actually re rebelled against that. They also didn't like the uh, increase in uh, salary for incoming CEO Hendrik de Toy uh, in that he's getting a bonus for 14 times his basic salary. So shareholders not really happy with Investec at the moment and you're seeing that in the share price down uh, from 96 to 91 and now uh, showing reflecting a loss for us. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the Ashburton mid-cap ETF was the one I wanted to focus a little bit of your attention on, and that shows how badly the middle tier of the stock market has been doing. So overall, our portfolio is is about breaking even on where we started in January 2017. Uh, the JSE All Share Index is up 9%. That's been hoisted there by resources. Remember, we don't invest in resources in this portfolio. And of course, by NASPAS, which is uh, which is a big part of this portfolio as well. Uh, but if you were to take out the overseas companies, and uh, you can then just see how much they have suffered. It has not been a good run. NASPAS, however, continues to rebound. Nice recovery for the for the company there uh, since those lows that it, it reached in March earlier this year. It was down to, well, the late 200s or 2,000 rand a share. It's now back to um, uh, 3,405 uh, rand a share today, um, but it was below 3,000 rand a share for, for quite some time. There's, there's good news coming out of it, uh, not if you read the newspaper headlines, which uh, seem to have been focused on Bob van Dijk's salary. Uh, a little bit of, of mischief making there, saying that he earned 1.6 billion rand. That's not really true. Uh, these are share options that he's accumulated over a period of time. His cash earnings were 30, 32 million rand, which when you convert it into US dollar terms, um, you wouldn't even get a senior person at uh, one of the big tech companies coming to join you. Uh, for that kind of that that, that kind of number, Van Dijk takes a, a very small part of his uh, his salary in cash. He takes a, a huge part of of it as much as he possibly can, just like his um, his mentor and uh, and chairman, of course, Becker, as much as he can, uh, related to the success of the company. And Van Dijk's been pretty pretty useful so far for Nasdaq shareholders. You might recall that it was he who was uh, involved in shepherding the uh, Flipkart deal, 
that uh, raised or, or, or delivered a $2.2 billion uh, benefit for NASPAS shareholders. And he's also been involved with uh, or intimately involved with uh, Delivery Hero, which is the German uh, food delivery company that's also um, been a very successful uh, uh, transaction. Van Dijk has uh, been telling uh, reporters recently that he would like to see parts of NASPAS uh, listed on other stock markets around the world. And given the, the way that this company has grown and its reliance recently on Tencent, which they, they're trying to reduce that, that impact, um, it is something that we could probably see some action on that in the near future. Maybe the food delivery businesses, and they've got one in uh, India, one in Brazil, and of course, Delivery Hero in Germany, and or Europe rather than Germany. That could be one. There's uh, online education that they're very excited about as well. So NASPAS, very happy to see it in the portfolio. Of course, it is going to be a little challenged when Tencent, the company that makes up NASPAS's total, total market cap plus another 35 odd percent um, when its results come out tomorrow. Uh, we'll be watching those quite carefully. Ten cents come from over 400 Hong Kong dollars a share to below 350. So we'll see the quarterly results coming out tomorrow. Discovery shook off the uh, sectoral slump. The insurance companies in South Africa were really under pressure. And you can see there uh, in last in the last time we had the portfolio, which was on the 23rd of June, uh, there was a um, Discovery was just about at its at its uh, lowest point. In, uh, in the past year, but it's rebounded quite nicely from that as there's been a reassessment that Discovery's life insurance, of course, it is an important part of the business, but this is now really a global co uh, company uh, with the UK operation, a significant, a substantial part of the business today, and uh, as well as its businesses in China and Europe and North America, and most recently, the deal that it did with Sumit Sumitomo Life in Japan. So. Uh, Discovery is the star performer on this portfolio and has uh, once again brought home the bacon. Uh, finally, um, Investec, I did mention that, but when you have a look at the share price, which has come down from 100 bucks uh, in the last two months to just above 90 Rand now, you've got to wonder if there's uh, it's time for the shareholders to start listening a little bit more closely, uh, sorry, the management to listen more closely to shareholders. Um, Investex is a fine business. Uh, it should not have been affected by the emerging market crisis to this degree, given that South Africa's RAND has not been affected that badly and that Investex have got a big business in the UK. But it has been, and uh, that's what we're looking at right now. And then finally, as far as the uh, SA Champions portfolio is concerned, I wanted to show you this graph, the SA mid caps. Um, thankfully, we aren't invested uh, totally in the SA mid caps, but we thought it was a good place to be after Ramaphosa's ascension. Uh, because usually um, if you get a rebound in the economy, you will see the mid caps benefiting most. Well, it's been the opposite, hasn't it? Uh, Ramaphoria has evaporated and the uh, mid cap ETF, which is supposed to be low risk uh, in the portfolio, has actually been uh, pretty much the worst perform performer all round. So not good news there. A, a good performance uh, from Wilson Bailey, which has held its end. And there was some news coming out of uh, the company, which is that it has acquired its second UK business, a company called Russell's Construction in Manchester. Uh, it paid 32.8 million pounds for Russell's construction itself. And then it took a, th about a, th a stake of about a third in Russell's homes uh, for just over three million pounds. Now, the uh, founders of Russell's, uh, Adam and Gareth Russell uh, are going to stay on in the business and uh, Wilson Bailey will no, no doubt uh, find synergies between Russell's construction and its other company that he bought in the UK which is Burn. It bought that business for 12 or 40 percent of that business for 12 million pounds in 2017. You might recall that Wilson Bailey went offshore in 2001 uh, to buy ProBuild which is now one of the major companies in this field in Australia. So uh, nice, slowly, the chairman, Mike Wiley, who's extremely entrepreneurial, is uh, seeing the company to its next phase. And uh, uh, that seems to be continuous globalization, nearly a, well, 850 million rand that it's now spent on international acquisitions in the last year and a half. Thanks, Alec. Um, there's a question off topic of it from Ivor. He wants to get your views on the British pound. Um, and just how you see it against uh, 
counters like the US dollar and euro, etc. Yes, I go. I, I guess that uh, whenever one looks at an asset class, you have to decide for yourself first and foremost um, what, how much certainty you have in it. If you have complete certainty, then what will usually happen with the asset class is that it will adjust to the level that uh, reflects the that certainty. Uh, when you have uncertainty, it tends to be vulnerable and, and uh, it, it tends not to appreciate on good news or to, uh, but just to fall on bad news. And the British pound ahead of Brexit is in a very uncertain place. So we saw the pound uh, in appreciating against the South African Rand, or you could call it the South African Rand depreciating against the pound uh, from around 17 to 18 and a half, nearly 19 uh, on this latest emerging market crisis, but it's pulled all the way back to below 18 now, um, eight, below 18 rands for a pound. Whereas against the US dollar, it's been a different story uh, where the rand has, has really fallen out of bed. If you were to take the cross between the US dollar and the British pound, the dollar has been strong against the pound now uh, for quite some time. Until Brexit has worked its way out of the system, there will be uncertainty. And as a consequence of that, you really are guessing. Um, it and and when you when you live in a country like the UK and you have a look at the um, the day to day developments on Brexit, it's very very hard to call. At some, at one point in time, it looks like Mrs May has got her cabinet together. It looks like the British population are um, have come to their senses about the Labour Party and uh, really don't want to vote in a socialist government here. Um, then at other times, it it goes the other way. So once Brexit is behind this country. I think we'll be in a position to make a, a sensible judgment on the pound. But for the moment, uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, your bet, your guess is as good as mine. Thanks, Alan. Um, Andrew just wants to know, is it a good time to be buying into these two portfolios? Andrew, yes. I must tell you, I'm, I'm really disappointed with the way the South African stock market has gone. Uh, and the way that the uh, the SA Champions portfolio has gone. I'm very happy to be investing in the exponential portfolio. We are probably going to be make some, making some adjustments there, uh, giving it a little bit more spice. I do like Twitter uh, it, long term. I do like uh, Netflix long term as well. They've come back really nicely. I'm worried about Microsoft. It's given us a fantastic rise. We had 38% on a huge company. So to expect Microsoft with, with remember, you've got Amazon growing at nearly 40%. Microsoft's growing at around 20%. Um, so you've, you've got to understand that eventually that growth will be reflected in the share price itself. Um, Apple, um, the ecosystem of Apple hasn't yet been fully appreciated. But Microsoft has got a huge challenge to its products in the form of Google. Uh, so just remember that. Uh, and Google, you don't pay anything for, uh, for Google Docs, whereas Microsoft, of course, you do pay for. So those are, and we're talking there about Office, which is a big part of Microsoft and Microsoft Windows, uh, which has its own competitors in other areas as well. So I've been very happy with Microsoft with the way that it's performed for us. But I would think that uh, you, you, you've got to start think, believing that if the chief executive is prepared to dump a third of his uh, stock, uh, he's sending you some kind of a message. On Alibaba, I love the business, but I'm afraid that uh, as long as Donald Trump is the president in the United States, uh, we're likely to see problems with any Chinese operation um, and Alibaba and uh, uh, of course, Jack Ma, who was in South Africa this week uh, and, and gave a, a fantastic talk. You can listen to it uh, on, on Biz News. It's on the homepage. Um, just go down the right-hand side of the homepage and you can click on Jack Ma's talk. But as good an entrepreneur as he is, uh, Alibaba is, its New York listing is dependent on uh, the, the sentiment amongst American investors. And right now that's turning against uh, companies like this. So I'm looking at those two, Microsoft and Alibaba, for different reasons, and looking at, uh, for different reasons, um, Netflix and Twitter. And perhaps there'll be an adjustment in the portfolio there. But uh, be assured, we'll keep our eyes on it. Outside of those, very happy with the rest of the portfolio, um, especially Adobe, our most recent edition.
Excellent. Thanks, Alec. I've just copied that link into the chat for anyone who wants to have a listen to Jack Ma in Johannesburg. Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, just to, to finish off then, if there are no more questions, if you'd like to pose a few, please send them through quickly. Um, but to finish off with, the exponential portfolio has been a phenomenal performer. As you can see, a 32% rise uh, in uh, the past year. Uh, we did uh, sell out of Facebook a little early, uh, but when there is scandal, that's another reason to, to get going. Um, uh, when, a, when a share price gets way beyond its uh, intrinsic value, uh, when you get the chief executive of a company selling big chunks of his shares, or when there's scandal, all three of those are reasons to, to, uh, for pause. Um, and in, in, the, in the Facebook case, the scandal still hasn't gone away. Uh, share price, as you saw in the most recent quarter, um, uh, took an awful hiding after the release of results. And it's likely, again, if you're living in a country like the UK, you just have to open your eyes and you'll see Facebook is advertising all over the place. Never used to advertise in the past. Now it's in The Economist, in the Financial Times most days. You'll see it in bus shelters, etc., saying we're fighting fake news. Now that all costs money. Um, adding more staff also costs money. So Facebook, thank you very much. Other people can uh, can uh, have that ride. We've uh, we're out of that one. But we haven't. We don't really make many changes to the portfolio. And uh, the changes that that I am contemplating, we'll, we'll 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 have a look at that in the next few days. Moving on to the uh, to the South African portfolio, the SA Champions portfolio. As you can see there, um, I think we need to do something in this portfolio to, to also give it a little bit more excitement. Long for life, I wouldn't be selling and certainly not Wilson Bailey, but the Ashburton mid-cap ETF uh, is at the moment, it's very disappointing and it's, it's, it's almost a little bit of a cop-out, isn't it, to invest in an ETF when you've got a direct bundle that you want to go to. On the South African side, I have been watching uh, famous brands very carefully. It looks like they're making a nice recovery in the UK with their business there and that's been the reason why famous brands share price has fallen of late and i've also been uh, looking at itel tile which is one of the great entrepreneurs in the country mr ravazotti um, those two um, are, are likely um, investments famous brands is of course a very entrepreneurial entrepreneurially driven business as well and even a slight uptick in the economy will have an impact on famous brands in South Africa but the real swing factor there is getting the UK right and it does look like they're making progress on that front. Investec, sure, you know to be selling Investec which is a fantastic business um, at these kind of levels you've got to have a little bit more than unhappiness with shareholders but at the moment shareholders are not uh, they aren't aligned with uh, management and that's never a good sign uh, for any business let's hope that they can sort that out well Stuart that's uh, our portfolio well within the 45 minutes we gave ourselves today if there are any more questions let's uh, let's just try and answer them yes thanks Alec. Uh, just from a rest is she wants to know your Alibaba comment does the same apply to Tencent because obviously that's in the other portfolio Tencent, Tencent's not listed in America so it hasn't had the, uh, the the boost from the United States investors, whereas Alibaba has. Alibaba's got uh, it, uh, it's it's got a big chunk of its investors who come from the United States, and it's almost like a it's becoming very nationalistic there now and very unpatriotic to be investing in China. It just it doesn't it, it confuses me. But uh, Tencent hasn't relied on that. It's listed in Hong Kong. Um, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be exposed to the same degree. Where you've got to watch with Tencent is the government interference because it is a, a huge business. And if the government starts interfering in the company uh, and they are, uh, it already works under some restrictions. There's, uh, there was a piece today talking about, I think it was on Business Day, talking about the, uh, the Chinese government not happy with one of the games that Tencent has, uh, has recently introduced. There's, there's this tension continuously between Tencent's management and the Chinese government, so you've got to keep an eye on that. But generally speaking, uh, Tencent doesn't, uh, wouldn't bother me in the same way as Alibaba would for this portfolio. If we had uh, Tencent invested and uh, if, if, for instance, this was the US and Hong Kong portfolio, I'd be quite happy to keep Tencent there. 
but because it's focused on uh, US exponential companies, um, we have to look at the constituents and Alibaba is one of them. Thanks, Alex. Just off that, um, Paul would like to know, would you increase your 10 cent exposure at these levels? I think wait for the quarterlies tomorrow, uh, read through the quarterlies, see if there's anything that is uh, concerning. And, uh, you know, 10 cent at 350 Hong Kong dollars is still, uh, uh, it might be down from over $400 where it traded not long ago, but it's still up on the year. So just be careful. Um, sometimes share prices spike and you certainly don't want to be buying them at the spike. But when you invest in a company, it's got to be done on the basis of you be prepared to hold on to those shares forever. If something happens that changes your mind, like, as I mentioned with Microsoft, the chief executive selling 30% of, of his holding, uh, that's got to be telling you that, uh, and you've had 38% gain in a year, uh, it's got to be telling you that, hang on, you, you need to reassess at these levels. Remember, long term, equities rise, if you're doing well, by 7% a year. So that's what you're talking about. So if you put on 30, 38% so far, and it's not even a year it's since November, um, you're talking about five years of, um, more than five years of returns that you've already got. So if you're given good reason to bank it, well, sometimes you need to. Uh, yeah, Microsoft's not one that I would ride, to, ride forever as I would with Amazon and, um, and Apple and, and Google. Well, certainly Apple, we haven't seen the full extent yet of uh, the appreciation of that massive ecosystem in fact it hasn't even come into the into the, the discussions yet you could see apple coming under pressure in september if uh, if analysts or traders aren't excited about the new products that come out it's possible so don't uh, don't expect that apple just continues to go up uh, indefinitely nothing does uh, but as far as microsoft's concerned we're going to be doing uh, doing some deep thinking on that. Thanks, Eric. Just want to close off. Uh, Eva wants to know: Are there any exponential shares listed in London? I know you can't buy them on this port uh, within this portfolio. But just wants to know if there are any that you know of. Are there many? Uh, but there no. Um, uh, these big guys are all uh, with their primary listings in the United States. But there are many exponential companies. If you keen in uh, in London. I would start looking, for instance, in the biotech areas. Um, you, you're just going to have to go a little bit below the radar and and, and finding uh, some of the uh, European companies that are in exponential industries. Uh, Spotify, I think, is, is listed there, although it's not one that I like particularly because uh, you've got Amazon and Apple, both uh, very, very strong competitors in the Spotify field. But uh, yes, there are, there are exponential companies listed everywhere. In South Africa, it's hard to find outside of NASPAS, uh, and you could almost make a case for Discovery being an exponential company, given the way that its uh, shared value idea is catching on around the world, and uh, it gives you leverage into some huge markets around the world. Uh, so you could talk about those too, but um, outside of that, I'm really not sure, whereas in London, you've got many hundreds of companies that are listed there. You just have to do your homework. Thanks, Alec. I think that's it. Andrew just wants you to please show him the US portfolio again before we leave. Pleasure, Andrew. Uh, there it is. We have 35% in Amazon, 21% in the S&P 500 index. That's down from an initial 25%. So that's your ETF. Um, Alphabet, uh, which is at 9% of the portfolio. Apple, 10%. Microsoft, 10%. And uh, and they started at eight. Um, all of the others started at eight. So you had um, eight fives are 40. Uh, and then we had 30, 30, I think was the way we, oh no, apologies. We actually sold out one of our stocks as well, um, Facebook. So it's not quite the way it, it worked, but uh, we had Apple uh, and Microsoft started at 8% of the portfolio. So what we tried to do was to, to have two bankers, Amazon and Vanguard, as our two bankers at 25% each. And then we spread the rest of the portfolio between six uh, stocks uh, that we selected at 8% on each of them. So you can see that uh, that's why Apple and Microsoft have gone up a little, but the, the surge in Amazon has taken it 
up to uh, 80, um, well, 35% of the portfolio. Thanks, Alex. Sorry, I've just got to, before we leave, Paul would like to know, would you ever consider starting a UK or Europe portfolio as you have done with the U US for, for us? <laughs> Paul, um, the reason we, it's, it's interesting because you have a look at the background. The reason we started the global portfolio with Standard Bank in the first place uh, in 2014 was because it was a need that Standard Bank had. They brought Web Trader in. We also felt at the time that the South African uh, investors had uh, needed to understand uh, international markets better. Uh, then when uh, Easy Equities came to us and they had these bundles, they said, how about putting something together for South African investors? So the intention there was to try and find South African companies that really were global businesses. And we looked at them as, as at the SA champions. And it, unfortunately, the universe there is tiny. Uh, hence, something like Steinhoff ended up in the portfolio. Fortune was only 6% of the portfolio, but it was there. Um, we had Breach in the portfolio, got out of that, thankfully, at, at, uh, before the crash uh, on that one came. But it's a very, very small universe. And uh, the way the South African market has been performing, um, it's very, very difficult to, to find uh, any stock there that uh, on the JSE that can actually buck the trend if it isn't a uh, international business as well, like Discovery and uh, and and uh, Naspas. And of course, then you that is excluding the resources stocks because our view is that resources are are, are taking away. I mean, they're people who are extremely good investors in resources, but the resources stocks do take away uh, the the benefit that you have in investing in a company, which is really um, human ingenuity. So we prefer not to invest in resource stocks. So that was the 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 whole idea behind these two bundles. Uh, then when Easy Equities did its US bundle, they said to us, wouldn't you like to put something together on that side, given the success of, a, of the global portfolio? And uh, the idea really is it just makes it very easy for people to invest into this. You can put your 250 Rand and you get your fractional share of this portfolio. So as things stand at the moment, that's pretty uh, time consuming. But uh, as, I, as, as business gets better uh, acquainted with uh, UK stocks and as we see more opportunities in this market, um, you, you'll probably find that uh, we might just uh, close down the SA Champions portfolio and focus instead on something else. As things stand at the moment, um, we are going to give the SA Champions another crack um, by maybe refocusing a little bit of that portfolio into some really, really good entrepreneurial stocks and uh, just just continue with the US one and 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 maybe refocus that one too on those two stocks that I have watched for a long 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 time Twitter and and Netflix and do like their stories and I like the 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 business models and so much about them so that's kind of being the changes that'll keep our hands full just to to watch those because remember what Warren Buffett tells us as well is that when you invest in a portfolio uh, treat it like a, a basket of eggs. Don't put too many in it. Um, you shouldn't have just one egg in the basket. You have a few, but you watch it like a hawk. And that's really what we're trying to do by just uh, continuously keeping aware of this. And you'll find on Biz News Premium, we cover these stocks a lot um, so that it also keeps you aware of, uh, of what's going on. Excellent. Thanks, Alec. I think that's it. I've got no more questions on my side. Well, thank you so much to everybody who joined us today and uh, nice attendance uh, that we've had for this uh, portfolio, for this uh, webinar. And uh, we will be back with our end of the month global portfolio webinar as per normal and the uh, the exponential and uh, SA Champions portfolio webinar uh, in three months time. We do this every quarter. So thanks for joining us. And well, I hope that the rest of the week and the day treats you well. Cheerio.